Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is a pro-revenge story. This is a story about an inconsiderate jerk finally getting their well-deserved come up in several years after their despicable behavior. It was around 2015 when I worked in the soul-crushing world of retail. It's sadly normal for there to be a constant stream of rude customers that make you question humanity. And then there are those whose actions are so appalling that they're etched into your brain forever. Luckily, one of these unforgettable incidents allowed me to extract my sweet, petty revenge. I had only been at this newly built store for about a year and was still finding my footing. Getting to know the delightful regulars and understanding that some people should be banned from public spaces, not an easy task for an introvert like me who avoids confrontation at all costs. But one customer, Mrs. Edna Wilson, an adorable elderly lady, always made time for a chat and was an absolute ray of sunshine. It had been a few weeks since I'd last seen her. But one morning, I watched as her car pulled into the disabled parking spot. She had a valid handicap placard. As she slowly exited the vehicle, leaning heavily on crutches with her leg in a cast, a work truck, without any disability markings, rudely parked in the adjacent handicap space, out jumped a burly man in his early 40s, Ted Barkley, accompanied by his teenage son. Well, this little old lady wasn't having any of it. With a surprising burst of courage, she confronted Ted, politely informing him that he shouldn't be parking there without a disability placard. What happened next is seared into my memory. This entitled jerk decided the best course of action was to humiliate and insult the poor, injured woman. He accused her of faking her disability, claimed her cast was a prop, and insinuated she was milking the system for benefits. Then, while hobbling away with an exaggerated limp, he and his son laughed mockingly as Mrs. Wilson stood there in stunned silence. Sadly, being the cowardly person I am, I did nothing in that moment, a decision that would haunt me for years. I later meekly asked a manager to intervene, but they couldn't be bothered to get involved. Over the years that followed, I'd see that same scumbag contractor come in and out of the store regularly. I never interacted with him directly, but every time I spotted him, that vivid memory of his cruelty towards Mrs. Wilson would resurface. I'd watch him park in the handicap spots without a care, and I even recognized his oversized blue Mercedes. Seven years later, in 2022, I was still at that same store, and Ted was still parking like an entitled prick. But that year, I was blessed with an opportunity for sweet, petty justice. Our store implemented a new system to deal with parking violations, and the employees were given special ticketing devices. Instead of having outside parties issue paper tickets, it was now our job to digitally record any cars breaking the parking rules. This was brilliant. As soon as I learned how to use the machine, I knew exactly what I was going to do. There were three main parking rules. One, no parking in handicap spots without a placard. Two, no parking in family child spots without a child present. And three, park within marked spaces only. Breaking any of these resulted in an $80 fine each time. It didn't take long for me to catch Ted in the act. The first time I saw that gaudy Mercedes in a handicap spot, I scurried out with the ticketing device and gleefully issued him a nice fat fine. After weeks of him receiving those notices and apparently ignoring them, his car suddenly started appearing in the family parking section instead. Oh, you want to play that game, huh? I thought with a smirk. Out came the ticketing device again, snap some pics of his child-free car in the family zone, submit, and BAM! Another string of fines headed his way. This entertaining little cycle continued for a while until Ted finally wised up and started parking properly. Well, not quite. His new M.O. was taking up two regular spots by straddling the line or parking crookedly. But rules are rules, so I happily kept issuing him ticket after ticket after ticket. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Those fines probably weren't even enforceable. And you know what? I really don't care for a few reasons. I was getting paid to do this, so it wasn't a waste of my time. It clearly got under Ted's skin since he kept adjusting where he parked. Even if he didn't pay, he still had to spend tons of time and energy fighting the fines, dealing with that harassment via mail. All told, if you add up each individual fine I issued him over that period, Ted racked up thousands of dollars worth of petty parking penalties for being a world-class jerk. The cherry on top? About three years later, I was walking through the lot and saw Ted absolutely losing it on some poor parking attendant, accusing the guy of being responsible for all his fines. Watching that toxic blowhard still raving like a lunatic after all that time brought me a sense of closure and smug satisfaction. Short version, I relentlessly issued a cruel person an absurd number of small parking fines adding up to thousands of dollars as payback for the way they mocked and insulted a disabled elderly woman years earlier. The next one is an entitled people story. 
My wife and I had just purchased our dream home out in the countryside. It was a beautiful property with tons of land, perfect for raising our young kids away from the noise and crowds of the city. The only downside was that our next-door neighbor was a bona fide Karen. From the moment we moved in, she'd come barging over making all sorts of demands about what we could and couldn't do on our own property. Things like telling us our kids were too loud when they played outside during the day, or freaking out if we parked our cars too close to her driveway. Real petty nonsense. We tried to be patient and brush it off at first, but Karen's behavior kept escalating. Anytime we were outside doing yard work or repairs, she'd march over and start lecturing us. It was everything from complaining about the colors we painted our house, to getting mad if we trimmed too many branches off our trees near her property line. The final straw came when I was mowing our lawn one weekend. Out of nowhere, Karen came storming across the yard, waving her arms like a madwoman. She started shrieking at me to stop because the lawnmower was too loud and scaring her cats. I calmly tried explaining that it was the middle of the day and I needed to cut the grass, but she just kept yelling to the point where I finally had enough and turned off the mower. When I told my wife what happened, we both agreed something had to be done. Karen's behavior was making it impossible to enjoy our own home in peace. After talking it over, we decided the best solution was to put up a privacy fence separating our property from Karen's. I did my homework and made sure to place the fence entirely on our land, leaving several feet of buffer between it and the property line. The last thing I wanted was to give Karen something legitimate to complain about. It took my buddy and I two full weekends to finish erecting the six-foot-tall cedar fence. I'll admit, it definitely changed the look of our place, but we were willing to sacrifice some curb appeal for privacy. Luckily, my wife agreed she'd rather have an eyesore fence than deal with Karen's eyesore behavior. For about a week after we put up the fence, things were blissfully quiet. No surprise encounters with a wild-eyed Karen. It seemed our problem was finally solved. Of course, we weren't that lucky. That next Saturday morning, we were sipping coffee on the back deck when we heard the familiar clomp of Karen's footsteps coming up the driveway. Seconds later, she was at the fence screaming at the top of her lungs. What is this monstrosity? How dare you put this hideous thing up without my permission? I tried to explain as calmly as I could that it was our property and we didn't need her blessing to install a fence. But Karen kept ranting, demanding we take it down immediately because it was an eyesore that was ruining her view. After ten minutes of pointless back and forth, I finally gave up and told Karen to get off our land and quit harassing us over our own fence. Well, that only made her more furious. She stormed off back to her house, all while shouting threats that she was calling the county about our illegal fence. Turns out Karen made good on her threats. The following week, I got a notice from the county inspector saying there'd been a complaint filed about our fence violating code. I had to take time off work to go down and provide documentation that everything was up to standards. Thankfully, the inspector agreed our fence was 100% legit and apologized for the trouble. I thought finally getting the county's approval would get Karen to back off. Nope. If anything, it made her even crazier. Over the next few weeks, she kept calling the police to our property claiming we were harassing her. Every weekend, patrol cars would show up because of some bogus noise complaint called in by Karen. Of course, the cops saw right through it, but it was beyond frustrating having to constantly deal with her lies. The final straw came on the 4th of July, when my whole extended family was over for a barbecue. We were all in the backyard when Karen came storming up to the fence, raising hell about us disturbing the peace with our music and chatter. Before I could even say a word, she reached through the fence and dumped a bucket of water on our grill, knocking hot coals and ash all over. Luckily, my niece and nephew were playing far away and didn't get burned, but everyone was absolutely outraged. I immediately called the police while my wife tore into Karen for dangerously trespassing and damaging our property. This time when the cops showed up, they had zero patience for Karen's excuses, especially after my wife showed them video footage I'd installed of Karen trespassing and vandalizing our grill. The officers filed a report and banned Karen from stepping foot on our property again. But we decided that wasn't enough punishment for everything she'd put us through. So we went down to the county clerk's office and filed for a restraining order against Karen to keep her away from us for good. The look on Karen's face a few days later when a sheriff's deputy showed up to serve her with the order was priceless. For once, she was speechless as the deputy informed her she'd be arrested if she so much as looked in our direction. Ever since the restraining order was issued, we've been blissfully Karen-free. The fence and cameras stay up just in case. But so far, she seems to have learned her lesson. In the end, Karen's ridiculous behavior brought us closer together as a family. We even laugh about some of her antics now. The fence turned into a running joke, with my niece and nephew decorating it with funny signs and pictures to give Karen something to really complain about if she ever comes around again.
So, in a weird way, we have Karen to thank for bringing some good old-fashioned family fun into our lives. Building that fence was the best move we ever made, even if it did ruffle a few feathers with our nightmare neighbor. But seeing Karen finally get a taste of karma for harassing us made it all worthwhile. The next one is a petty revenge story, so recently my younger bro has really been annoying me, like he ate all the chips I bought for myself with my name written on the bags. Slapping me randomly despite me not doing anything to him, stealing my stuff and hiding it in random places, etc. Thing is... He's scared of clowns. Like, super scared. He's even scared of cartoon clowns. He even won't watch Batman movies because he's scared the Joker will be in them. Well, about a month ago, I was at a local thrift store and found a two-foot clown doll. The thing was actually kind of scary. So I bought it and hid it in my closet thinking it would come in handy. Well, a few days ago, turns out my little bro stole all my money and, well, he went to the mall with his friends and bought some shoes with the money he stole. I was really pissed, but he wouldn't apologize even after I told my parents. Later that night he was at football practice, while my parents were at a fancy restaurant, so I was home alone. Still mad at what he did, I decided to go in my closet and get out that clown doll, glued a knife to his hand, and hid it in my brother's bed. Well, later that night he got home, and I was just chilling in the family room watching Power Rangers Ninja Steel on Netflix while eating a bowl of mint ice cream, when suddenly I hear a loud scream come from upstairs. Yep, he found the clown doll. He was scared crapless and I couldn't stop laughing and told him that is what he gets for stealing my money and for bugging me. He deeply apologized and begged me that as long as I don't scare him with that doll again he will stop bugging me and give me his money from his piggy bank, to which I accepted, and then went back downstairs to finish what I was doing. So far, he hasn't bugged me a single time after that incident. The next one is a malicious compliance story. Many years ago, I was working in my state's police department. We got a new inspector at the station, and he wanted to chart what all the sections of the station did and instituted a daily diary where we had to put in an account for every minute of the shift. Lots of grumbling from the troops over the next few weeks. The inspector would go off about the forms not being recorded properly every day at change of shifts and the said that there would be consequences if they did not truly reflect what we did. I spoke to my shift in queue, malicious compliance. I used to get into work 30-odd minutes early to fuel the car, gather my crime-fighting kit, wash the car, and prepare for the shift. Now I didn't do this until the minute my shift started. I would then complete these tasks after having started, then calibrate the radar, see what black spots were to be targeted for day, look at work emails, review the previous night's occurrences and a myriad or other things before heading out onto the road. Now on each and everything I did, I would record it precisely, even recording the record on the record. Each traffic stop, each job, stopping to give directions or advice would go on the sheet. Then I would return to the station for lunch. Normally I would grab it on the go or eat it in my car. But hey, he wants the official day's duties. Our employment law required that each officer was entitled to one half hour uninterrupted meal break each shift after five hours of duty. The inspector trying to make the station more efficient started to roster meals before this time. Boss tried to order us to take our meals as recorded on the roster. We all disregarded it and took our meals after the five hours. At the end of the day, we attached the industrial award to the daily record and wrote as per industrial law meal break taken at first possible time after five hours. He went off and threatened us to take the meals as written or write-ups would happen. That was reported to the union who threatened industrial and legal action, which he would be personally responsible for. He was forced to rescind that threat, so he gave up on that and doubled down on the daily reporting writing officers up for non-compliance. I told them all I was doing, and the single page issued at the beginning of the shift was now three to four pages long, each and every day for 80 officers for three shifts. We swamped him with the information. In addition, if a job was broadcast, we were forced to abandon our meal break and attend to the job. Most times, we could not return to finish our meals, so often went hungry. Now, the other part of our meal break rule was that if we did not have a full one-half-hour uninterrupted meal break, then we would be paid the whole meal break. The boss had a habit of going into the meal room to have an idiot complain or harass the officers in there. So, when he did this, it was recorded as an interruption. After a few weeks, productivity was down, hours wasted, his budget being blown out as he had to pay for interrupted lunch breaks, which he then denied payments until the union lodged a court injunction and took the police department to court for each and every single breach for each person in shift. This amounted to hundreds of matters and thousands of dollars. He said all the daily reporting logs with our interrupted meal breaks were somehow lost. That's okay, the union says. Here are the copies taken. He argued that they were done after the court date and were false. But everyone also took copies after they were lodged with his admin assistant with his received stamp on it. 
fail for him, the department's solicitor approached the union with an offer for us to withdraw the matter, they offered 25% of what we were owed, and all the reprimands would be lifted. It was rejected, and the full 100% was demanded, and the reprimands totally withdrawn and deleted from the records. His honor ruled in our favor in every single matter. We were all awarded out meal money and compensation for the time wasted with the department fighting this all the way. He was directed him to pay when claimed and all reprimands deleted immediately, or penalties would be issued. He had two days to comply. This was Friday afternoon, so he had the weekend to get rid of them. Took him until 9 p.m. Sunday night to do it and he wasn't paid for the time. As we swamped his entree with over 160 pages of daily worksheets each and every shift every day, that's at least 480 pages a day of compliance. He then tried to demand that we only put serious issues down. We all refused, as he had already informed us all that if we did not put everything down, we would be charged with disobedience. But if we followed his new order, we would be disobeying his previous order. He then threatened to charge us all with disobedience if we did not do the new rule. The sergeant sent all this to the union with the threats, and to his boss and his boss's boss. Wouldn't you know, several days later all his daily reporting sheets were not to be used any longer. Apparently the union sat down with the district command bosses and let them know that this would be a continuing matter if the inspector was not moved, and that their own positions were now up for review of the mismanagement they allowed and the fine the department received from court. The commissioner of police was notorious for terminating those who stuffed around with the troops and dragged the department into court for mismanagement. They had already been embarrassed in court, had the police department receive court costs and fined for the breaches, and could see another court appearance looming and saw the damage he was doing to the station and promptly transferred him to the district office where he could not supervise anyone. His contract was not renewed eight months later and left the department. Those who had known the inspector say he had no idea what problems he caused, and was just trying to make the organization more efficient. When they told him how much he made things worse, he just said that the troops never minded missing lunch or eating in the cars before. They told him that his demand to strictly follow policy alienated everyone, and to put another daily reporting sheet on top of the department's official daily diary was just superfluous. At the end of the day, he had no clue why he lost his job. There were many other stupid things he did, like not issuing pens until the ones we had were fully out of ink so we had no pen to sign the requisition, and his admin staff were instructed not to lend pens out to sign or we could buy a pen from them. The exemption to the rule that if it was lost, we could get another one. Cue more malicious compliance. The next one is an entitled people's story. I go to a local coffee shop regularly. It's also important to know it's a drive-up stand, and they have runners that come to your car to take your order when it's busy. I know all the people who work there quite well. I'm always amazed when they remember my order, which I don't expect in the least. They will get new people on occasion, they all apologize for not knowing my order, and I tell them that I'm still in awe that they would even try. They are all very sweet. On occasion, they will tell me about other regulars that get bent out of shape when someone doesn't know their order. This was just told to me today by one of the newer employees. Sheila is also a regular, an entitled one. She gets very upset when someone doesn't know her order. This is what happened today. Employee. Hi, what will you be having today? Sheila. My order. Employee. I'm sorry, I don't quite remember what it is and I wouldn't want to put in the wrong order. Sheila. I'm a regular. You should know my order. Figure it out. Employee. I'm sorry, I've only been here a few weeks, so I haven't memorized everyone's orders yet. Sheila. That's not my problem. You should know mine. I'm a regular. Employee. I'm sure I will in time. Can I please take your order now? Sheila. No. This EP actually refused to tell her what her order was because she wanted the employee to miraculously recall it. Employee. I can't get it started if I don't know it, Sheila. Well, they do. While she motions to the stand and the baristas. So, the employee sent the baristas a message through the system stating, Sheila is here and would like her drink. Sheila is obviously a troubled person if she gets this upset over coffee. The employee told me she was screaming at her. Sheila was also holding up the line of cars and they charge you out at your car, so she caused further delay by having to be charged out at the window. All over coffee. This is also not the first time she's pulled this nonsense. I hope I get to see this in person someday so that I can intervene and put Sheila in her place. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.